final scenes in Purgatorio may puzzle those accompanying Dante the Pilgrim this far in his journey. Of course, these last cantos are set in a place only glimpsed at in our collective distant memory, the place of all beginnings, the earthly paradise. If you're feeling challenged by the highly symbolic nature of these last six cantos, you're in good company, full of splendor and apocalyptic vision. They challenge the reader's ability to understand the literal details of these cantos in terms of the fourfold allegorical method of interpretation Dante outlined in his letter to Con Grande. All along the way, Dante the Pilgrim and the reader have been working at achieving this high level of reading, especially since the method of interpretation not only unifies the reading of sacred scripture, but also grounds one faith in the truth of the Incarnation. Before entering into this canto, I want to take a moment to recall some of the more or less agreed upon meanings of the symbolism of the chariot and Beatrice, as well as recall important moments from Dante's whole journey that may help us make some sense of this canto. The reason why I say more or less agreed upon is that Symbolism requires interpretation, and not everyone agrees with some of the interpretations of the chariot imagery. This feature of the poem is why it's so exciting. So most people agree that the griffin represents the incarnation of Christ. The eagle represents both his divine nature as well as his authority as a king of heaven. The lion is human nature and his authority as a king of this world. Beatrice has many symbolic significances. She can be seen as theology, revealed truth, ecclesiastical authority, the ideal papacy, uh, and also the contemplative life. The three handmaidens that we saw, of course, are the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. And the other four handmaidens of Beatrice are the cardinal virtues, justice, moderation, prudence, and fortitude. And finally, we have Matilda, who represents the active life. The chariot itself is the church triumphant. So the moments from prior cantos that I want to remind you of are the same moment in the Inferno when Dante is entering into the last part of hell. Why? Well, in this canto, no one can see, and his vision is completely distorted. At this same place in the Inferno, Dante met with sinners whose vision was completely blocked by their sin and evil. Now, at the opposite end, he's regained innocence, and Dante now has a vision that's beginning to be accustomed to divine light. Another moment that I want to recall is anti-purgatory, the place of preparation for purgatory proper. Just as anti-purgatory was a preparation for Dante's entrance into purgatory, so the earthly paradise is a entrance point into paradise. Dante must learn here how to read the events of history allegorically to interpret the figuration of symbols in order to see reality more clearly. Approaching the end of his time on Mount Purgatory, Dante is only at a turning point in his journey. And so this place being a turning point is propedeutic or preparatory to the much more strenuous activity awaiting him and us in the next realm. Since we have probably more than once attempted to see the depths of the Comedia itself after a couple of readings, these embodied images throughout Canto 32 acts as vessels, so to speak, in which the light that he attempted to behold full on may be glimpsed at indirectly much like the mirroring effect that we saw Dante use earlier at the end of Canto 31. You may recall that at the end of that canto, Beatrice's handmaidens, Faith, Hope, and Charity, had entreated Beatrice to turn her face toward Dante the Pilgrim and unveil her lips so that he could behold her second beauty. Of course, that he is now capable of regarding her beauty so fully is the result of his earlier confession and contrition as well as Matilda's cleansing of his memory of evil in Lethe. When Beatrice reveals her beauty directly, Dante the poet admits the limits of his poetic powers to justly render it in words, but instead helps us understand its power through its effect on the pilgrim at the opening of Canto 32. My eyes, he said, were then so fixed and so intent to satisfy the thirsting of 10 years 
that every other sense in me was spent. And those eyes had a wall of cannot care on either side, for so the holy smile ever attracted them with the old snare. Through this synesthesia, which describes the experience of one of our senses, in this case, the sense of seeing, with the other senses, the sense of taste, Dante shows his longing to drink in the vision before him. Luckily for him, he's being monitored by Beatrice's three lovely handmaidens, and he still has his sense of hearing that breaks his too fixed gaze when he hears, you stare too fixedly. Of course, he doesn't know which of them uttered this curb on his gaze. Most likely it was the one representing charity since she represents love. The result of his ardent gaze is that he is momentarily blinded by Beatrice's brilliance. He describes this blinding with the apt simile of having stared too long at the sun. This image of blinding reminds us of Paul being blinded on the road to Eumaeus. And you might recall that early on in the Inferno, Dante said, I am not Paul, I am not Aeneas. Well, he was wrong. He is becoming a kind of Paul. This begins his evangelical calling to the world. As we see at the end of the canto, when Beatrice tells him that he has to go back and share what he saw when he visits the Imperium that she's about to take him to. When his sight returns to him after being dazzled by Beatrice's brilliance, he refocuses his attention on the chariot and its retinue and watches the procession pass at it, as it maneuvers a turn eastward where it came from. That he is momentarily blinded by looking too intently on Beatrice's beauty should not be considered a moral failing. Instead, it suggests that his newly cleansed eyes are not strong enough to pierce deeply into the revealed truth that he's attempting to perceive. Remember, Beatrice allegorically represents wisdom, sapientia. The caution he receives from one of the theological virtues just tells him that he's not ready to see truth itself, but he still must have that truth mediated through the allegorical, through figuration, Beatrice herself, the chariot, the griffin, the holy attendants, which he describes as lesser things in relation to what he was attempting to fathom as he looked into Beatrice's eyes. Though his eagerness and energies are bent on the task, his faculty simply must grow. This lesson, like so many in the whole poem, remind us of the slow and agonizing process of any transformation, what we call education. And so we might even find a bit of solace in it. So in many ways, this canto is really about education and about how to read how to be educated, especially if one is pursuing wisdom. Of course, the very place to begin is at the very beginning, which is why Dante, Statius, and Matilda follow the chariot to the center of the garden where we find the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Upon arrival, the whole host murmurs, Adam! What the pilgrim then sees is that this tree is barren, no fruit and no leaves. This tree in its barrenness demonstrates that the violation of the divine edict has put the human race in the darkness of ignorance rather than brought them to the light of knowledge. Dante then sees the pole of the chariot wrap around the tree and the two of them become one. From this combination of the pole and the tree, the branches are being renewed and Dante glimpses color return to the tree he tells us it's a tint less than rose, but more than violet. He then hears a hymn in a language he doesn't understand, yet it's so sweet that it puts him to sleep. Well, if this is Dante's first lesson in reading scripture, he's not off to a great start, is he? <laughs> but imagine any of those times that you've read something incomprehensible, something you grasp as amazing, extraordinary even, but just out of reach of your ability to articulate what you know. What Dante has just witnessed and tried to read in the way that the griffin joins the pole to the wood of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the story of salvation. It's the wood of the cross 
and the pole of the chariot, beginning the work of redemption for fallen man. That redemption, however, must be carried out by the church after Christ's ascension. After his nice sleep, he wakes and compares himself to those who witnessed Christ's transfiguration on Mount Tabor. Now, of course, the transfiguration was that glimpse into the true glory of Christ that was so brilliant that Christ himself had to make it less brilliant. So now Dante is signaling to us that truly reading, seeing into the symbolism, is a kind of transfigurative moment. The next scene takes Dante to Beatrice, where he will receive an even more complicated education through the reading of historical events in the apocalyptic vision that he's given in, as he sits with Beatrice. It is also here that Dante is commanded to take news of what he experiences to the world. The vision that he is shown by Beatrice and that he must read allegorically is the seven calamities that have befallen the church from its beginning to Dante's own time. Now, if you read the notes, you know that each of the moments of the allegorical vision represent one of the calamities. Uh, the first calamity is the persecution of Christians. The second, the heresies that threaten the early church. The third, the corruption of the church through the donation of Constantine, which of course has been talked about throughout the comedy. The fourth was the, th the further corruption of the popes through the gaining of political power. The fifth was a great schism which many believe to point to the rise of Islam. The sixth is the imperial power conceded to the papacy by the Emperor Albert. And then the final one depicts the greed and corruption of the papacy in Dante's own time. Now this kind of reading is the beginning of understanding how the church's history and how scripture help us to understand God's plan. Now this, again, is the reading that he's being introduced into as the, as the path towards theology, as he sits with Beatrice. There'll be much more to contemplate and much more complicated theology to understand as he moves on to the last canto of Purgatorio and then up towards paradise.